coming up on Public Affairs Today. In this economy, everyone has to be more efficient, including the nonprofit sector. 80 local nonprofits are finding help with that through UCF. That's just ahead. This program was made possible by a grant from the UCF College of Health and Public Affairs, which promotes excellence in undergraduate and graduate education, research, and community service in health-related professions and public affairs. Hello and welcome to Public Affairs Today. I'm Alicia Callanan Mandigo. Public affairs is a dynamic, multifaceted field that touches your life in everyday ways you may not realize. Issues of law, charitable work, and social work are just some of the things that fall under the public affairs umbrella. The topic on the table today is helping nonprofits become more effective. Two guests join me in the studio today. First, Mary Ann Feldheim from UCF's Department of Public Administration within the College of Health and Public Affairs. After that, I'll be joined by Mark Brewer, President and CEO of the Community Foundation of Central Florida. But first, you've probably heard of them at some point, a handful of nuns who 40 years ago set out to help the migrant farm community in Apopka. Today, their organization is known as the Hope Center. As I said, they've been at it for 40 years, so it would seem they have things figured out. But a new UCF program is making a big difference for their organization. This mural tells the journey, the journey of immigrants, the journey of the Hope Community Center itself. 40 years ago, a small group of nuns stepped up to help the migrant farmers of Apopka. Today, they operate out of a beautiful new facility. The Hope Community Center has staff and widespread recognition. And now, it has a new perspective on running a nonprofit. I was, I'd say, pretty much a skeptic about those trainings to start with. I, when we were accepted as a grantee, I thought, oh, this is great. And then I saw, you know, kind of what all the requirements, you know, were, and I thought, oh, trainings, I've been to trainings. Although it's been around for 40 years, it's only been three years since the Hope Community Center organized as a 501c3 charitable corporation. And that status enabled the organization to apply for UCF's Strengthening Communities in Central Florida program. What this program does, it has three key components. One is training, which we see as the backbone of the program. And then we see te technical assistance as reinforcing the training. And we have a sub-award process where the organizations can customize their uh, addressing their ca capacity building needs. The 40 organizations that went through the UCF training are pretty different. They all have different functions within the community. So there are basically two common threads, one being geography. They're either in West Orange, South Lake, or South Sumter County. And the other common thread is that the organization somehow is assisting people with getting through this tough economic period. The Hope Community Center is one of a total of 80 organizations that will benefit from the Strengthening Communities program. All 80 of the organizations going through the program will receive training on how to operate more effectively. But only some of the participants receive grants. And Sister Ann will tell you, she was in it for the money. We actually were able to buy round tables. Now you may think that that is you know, ridiculous. But we have parent cafes, we have kids cafes, we have parent and kid cafes, we have our own faculty, you know, faculty staff meetings. And if you can sit around a round table, it creates a sense of community and a, and a place of engagement where nobody is out of the circle. The Hope Center was also able to buy computers, allowing people to pursue online classes in their native language from places like University of Mexico. The money is great, but Sister Ann will now tell you the training made the difference. You know, from board development to actual practical service delivery to program development to the financial pieces, I mean, all the different aspects that were, you know, that were, were offered. I didn't hear one person say, um, boy, that was a waste of time, or, well, I, you know, it was okay, but it wasn't that. Everybody came back and said, that was really good. <laughs> we really learned something practical and useful. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, you know, to, to go. I think they were lucky and we were lucky. It's a really good fit, you know. Um, they have been here for a while um, and 
made a decision to uh, invest in their um, organizational development. Um, and it happened to coincide with the same time this grant opportunity was offered to them. So it really was, you know, a, a meeting of the minds there. Volunteer coordinator Laura Fertel also went through the training and felt it improved every element of her job, from grant writing to working with the organization's dozens of volunteers. We are a small grassroots organization, and it's one of the things that we really love about ourselves and want to maintain that kind of cultural identity. But we realize the need to build some infrastructure so that we're around for another 40 years. Um, the sisters are in their 60s and, and you know, approaching 70, and we know that um, they have been one of the primary um, visionaries for the organization, but they're not going to be around forever. And so it just seemed like a, a fortuitous moment to be able to take advantage of the, the expertise at, at a time when we, um, we are very much at sort of a crossroads. It is not a confusing crossroads. It is now a crossroads with a clear direction. UCF is the only institution in Florida to receive a stimulus award from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Strengthening Communities Fund. Joining me now is Dr. Marianne Feldheim from UCF's Department of Public Administration within the College of Health and Public Affairs. Thank you for joining me today. And you are the department chair as well as one of the main crafters of the new program that is um, focusing on nonprofit management. That's correct. I have been uh, with the department for 13 years, and we have had nonprofit programs since 2001. We have been really working with students and the community during that entire time. But what's new is that there is a master's program now that focuses on nonprofit management. Tell me a little bit about that. The master's program was started in 2004. It is a uh, graduate program that's fully online, and we have uh, our full-time faculty teaching in that, along with uh, one or two very qualified adjunct faculty from the community. The difference with our program is, first of all, because the full-time faculty are teaching, they take a very, they take pride in the quality of the courses. So these courses are very rigorous. Many people who enter the program do not realize that an online course is as rigorous as it is. The reason for that is we require a great deal of integration and synthesis of the knowledge that students learn in the readings and discussions and applying that to real life situations. One of the ways we do that in this program and in many of our other programs is through service learning. Service learning at UCF is a uh, very large initiative, but the definition for UCF is that students apply the actual content of their course to a real organization. So that I teach strategic planning, I teach volunteer management, I've taught program evaluation, and in each of those courses, students take the content and actually craft a strategic plan for an organization. I would imagine that there are a lot of organizations out there that are really getting big benefits from this because when someone starts a business, they write a business plan and they consult with people and they try to map things out as well as they can. A lot of nonprofits are started because someone has an idea of a need and so then they just kind of go at it heart and hand and they don't go in it, into it quite as strategically as perhaps a business owner might. Yes, many people going into nonprofit, uh, starting a nonprofit or going into nonprofit management come from the heart. They come with a passion. We do have several students in the program who are either the executive CEO or board members on nonprofits that they have been involved with and actually started. One is uh, Tryon Vecca, which is a writing academy that uh, focuses on providing writing experiences for developmentally challenged young children. Equine therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, 
the gentleman in charge, Roger Meadows, is in our program, and he has taken every class and applied it to his organization. In our volunteer management class, he did not really have a training program before. He developed one. He did not have job descriptions for one for his wife, because uh, the entire family is involved with this nonprofit. So he developed actual job descriptions for the positions that people were playing but did not have parameters set. So he took the opportunity in that class to learn everything he could and make his organization much better. When you talk about, for instance, defining roles for volunteers, um, and since you're using this particular example, perhaps we can stick with it. W what needs to be defined? Um, because I guess if you're thinking about a horse stable, okay, there's stalls to be cleaned and there's hay to be thrown. And so what, what did he need to figure out there? Well, he first of all needed to decide how many volunteer roles there actually were. The, uh, the one for his wife specifically was that she was the volunteer coordinator, but did not really have that job description. So actually helping her understand all the parts that were involved in managing volunteers was really helpful. So the, the other part in job descriptions for volunteer managers is that it really provides the volunteer with the guideline for what do I do, how do I do it, what do I not do? Because you do indicate in the, the job descriptions the parameters of the role and you also put the limitations, the things that are really not part of that role for the protection of the volunteer and the organization and certainly the children who would be, uh, who would be coming and participating. Give me some details on the master's program. It's an online program. I believe you mentioned to me previously that it's one of only two in the state of Florida? That's correct. Florida Atlantic is the other, and Florida Atlantic's program is face-to-face. -face. It's, last I heard, smaller than ours. Ours is really quite large. We currently have 173 students in the program, and we have had up to this time 134 who have graduated. So we're very proud of the fact that we have 134 graduates. That's 130 in Florida and four nationwide. So most of them are there. The components that are in our program are the unique things that apply to the nonprofit sector. We do have, as I indicated before, strategic planning, which is found certainly in the business sector, but for the nonprofit sector, the focus becomes much more important on the mission, certainly following the mission and making sure that their strategic plan is aligned with their mission. It also focuses on the use of volunteers very heavily. Now we know that the Strengthening Communities program is really benefiting the community. How does that play into the education that your graduate students are getting? Well, in many ways, the, um, the programs that we have in our department are uh, really building the capacity of the nonprofit sector. We've had uh, 134 graduates, as I indicated before, which now provide uh, the workforce or a part of the week workforce that are really skilled in nonprofit management. The other part is that we are strengthening communities through something which we talked about before, the service learning. In almost all of our courses, there is a service learning component. Our students have uh, written grant proposals in the grants and contract management class and brought in sometimes very large sums of money for the organizations that they've provided those for. Uh, the new Donors Edge coming out of the community foundation that Mark Brewer may be talking about in a little bit asks for things that uh, demonstrate to the funders and to the community the viability and strength of an organization. One of those is a strategic plan and our students are assisting many different organizations in our community in writing strategic plans. We do that uh, on a, uh, it's a stepwise basis that each 
week or two weeks, they are doing a part of the plan. They meet with the stakeholders in the organization. They work very closely so that the plan really is aligned with the needs of the organization. And it also is then aligned with the formatting and the content that a true strategic plan would incorporate. Great. I'm just about out of time, but I would like you to tell me quickly, you mentioned that this is a growth segment. Why do you think it's seeing so much growth? The nonprofit sector, which is the third sector in our economy, truly at this point in time is the only one that is growing. The public sector with the difficulties we've seen with uh, state budgets and local budgets have had to cut back and are resorting to volunteers in many ways. The private sector we know has uh, seen significant downturn. The nonprofit sector really is addressing the increasing needs that the uh, current economic situation has created the increased homelessness, the increased need for uh, things like the Second Harvest Food Bank, so that uh, the safety net in our community is really woven together by nonprofit organizations. All right, thank you. I've been talking to Marianne Feldheim from the Department of Public Administration within UCS College of Health and Public Affairs. Thank you for joining me today. We'll be right back, and then I'll be joined by Mark Brewer from the Community Foundation of Central Florida. Don't go away. With me now is Mark Brewer, President and CEO of the Community Foundation of Central Florida, an organization dedicated to helping area nonprofits. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Alicia. So when you talk, you use terms like investor and marketplace, and these are terms that we don't normally associate with the nonprofit world. Tell me why you talk like that. Oh, well, uh, nonprofits are businesses, just like private sector businesses, but they aren't private sector businesses. We, however, measure all of the pieces the same way you would in the private sector. There's a marketplace for giving. Most people think of giving as something only a few of us do or some of us do, but they don't really realize there's a marketplace out there and we can measure who's giving and how much they give. We can also see that the nonprofit sector looks different than most people think it does. It is, in essence, the center of the quality of life of a community. So healthcare, education, arts and culture, social services, the faith-based communities, they're all under the nonprofit sector umbrella and they all attract people who invest. Some of them are givers, some of them are philanthropists, but they're all investors in the sector and the work it does. See, I think that's an interesting point because I don't think that many of us view nonprofits in that light, that they're at the center of quality of life. Right. And some of us might even look at them as being a little burdensome, oh God, here they come asking for money again. Right. <laughs> you know? So if you could just talk a little bit again about the importance of nonprofits to communities. Well, they're, they're critical. If you think of the three sectors, the public sector, the government, the private sector, which drives economic development, and then the nonprofit sector provides two things that people commonly refer to, but they don't always understand. One is the safety net. That would be the social service nonprofits. But in recent years, some things have begun to change. One of them is those five elements that I mentioned to you, n most of them are not, nor do they have any connection with the private sector, which means if you and I aren't making gifts to them or investing in them, they won't be around. So if you were to move to Central Florida and you wanted to stay here for a while and you didn't have access to health care, education, arts and culture, social services, or the faith-based communities, you wouldn't have the very thing that keeps most people in the community when they move here. And so when we start to look at how we're going to get better economic development or how the public sector is going to be able to build more sustainable infrastructure in the future, it turns out the nonprofit sector is the glue that holds all of that together. 
but it doesn't stay together unless you and I make an investment in the sector. And that's what most people don't understand. They think of it as a, a need-driven sector where they tell us the need and we go and give until we hurt or can't give anymore. The reality is we as investors can drive that sector to a higher level and that's been the change over the last 15 or 20 years in the economy of the nonprofit sector. So that's interesting because it kind of sounds like when we're talking about economic development, both sides, both the nonprofit sector and the private sector, need to kind of change their pitch for mm -hmm. what is going to make the community attractive to new industry and yeah, new residents and things like that. Absolutely, two examples for you. If we were going to try to attract uh, higher paying jobs and major corporations without a strong arts uh, component to the community, they likely wouldn't come. But they also wouldn't pay for arts, nor would the public sector. Instead, it's the nonprofit sector that builds the arts community and it's invested in. Second, if you're a small business owner and your annual salary or your hourly salary isn't enough to provide health insurance, we better have access to good health care, otherwise your employees won't stay here and neither would you. So the two really are locked together in the future of the economy of Central Florida. You were talking with me last week about a recent study mm -hmm. in which they were looking at giving, these are large people who give large amounts of money. Right. Um, I think they were using the term $80,000. Um, individuals or families that would right. normally make a gift of $80,000 had to cut back to $50,000. And, and the study was examining the impact sure. on nonprofits. And, what, and one of the things that the study found was that people who, who give small gifts, $50, mm -hmm. $25, their giving hasn't really changed. It's been the larger donors right. who have changed their giving. Tell me what that says about I guess, the nonprofit world right now. Sure, well, it, it means a little bit of pain and it means growth that's been stymied a bit. And it also means a rethinking or an innovation that's taking place. So just in market terms, if we were to separate donors, anybody who writes a check for any amount, from philanthropists, who are people who typically make longer range investments using lots of different kinds of capital. They might not be giving cash, they might be giving stocks or real estate or other kinds of assets. If we divide those two, those $80,000 donors are really major gift donors. They're people that when the water's high, as economists say, and you can't see the rocks, and they have the capital, they give it. But when it isn't, they don't. The lower level donors, you and I, always give. And in fact, in worse economic times, they typically give more. Part of that reason, sociologists think, is because they're closer to the need. If you've ever lost your job or didn't have enough food in the cabinet, when you've got money, you tend to give to programs remembering what it was like when you were there. Those $80,000 donors probably haven't had that experience, and so they're basically working with the capital available, and when the marketplace comes back, likely they'll come back as well. When we spoke previously, you walked me through the difference between a donor, an investor, and a philanthropist, and I found that really interesting. Sure. So if you could go through that again. Sure, well, donors are primarily quid pro quo givers, all right? They give from the heart, mostly, and they tend to only want to fund need, and so they'll say things like, I only want to give to the children. I only want to give to the people that have need. It doesn't really occur to them that you have to have people employed and you have to have a building with lights on in order to do that. They're very focused on the personal need of the people they're giving to. And there's almost always something in it for them, a black tie dinner, a golf tournament, maybe just a t-shirt. But many of them, the transaction happens when they're doing something they enjoy doing, experiencing something, and the proceeds from that go to help a good cause. The research is clear, they don't always know what the good cause is, and in some cases it doesn't matter to them as long as it's a reliable and well-managed good cause. As you move up that continuum, you run into people who are philanthropists. Their focus is really more about how to solve problems. So as a donor, I might give to a homeless program to help feed people today. A philanthropist would more likely be thinking about how do we stop the flow of homeless people? How do we provide job training or scholarships or something at a higher level that stops the flow of people into this? In other words, they want to own a benefit. They want to solve a problem. And so they're typically making larger gifts longer out. And then investors are typically anyone to the right of a donor, anyone who over a period of time thinks about making a gift multiple times. So if I were to write you a check today for $100, I'm a donor, but if I make a pledge to do that for the next five years, I'm an investor at a low level, but an important investor all the same. So if we could reflect back for a moment on the earthquake in Haiti, mm -hmm. that's an instance where it attracted a lot of donors. Right. I'm wondering now how many investors or philanthropists 
were attracted by that disaster? That's a good question. I think the investors and philanthropists are on TV and you see them pretty frequently. There are some actors and some other folks who have really taken on that process and they're there. They're engaged and invested where the rest of the money was really a transaction that a donor does. I feel bad when I see this on TV. I know people are hurting. I don't know what to do. The one thing I can easily do is text a gift or write a check or send a credit card gift. The issue with the donors is that they didn't stay very long. In fact, in some recent studies, the youngest of those donors who gave by text gifts, the majority of them, once they texted the gift, never went back. They had their moment and then moved on to the next thing. That's interesting. So we the donors, I'm sorry, the investors and the philanthropists are really critical in that they kind of serve as the engine. Absolutely. For everything. Here's an analogy for you. In the private sector, you and I need to go get capital to start a business. We need to find an angel. In the nonprofit sector, that's a donor. Someone's going to give us a little bit of money because we asked. In the for-profit sector, we move up then to need a venture capital. We need more capital to build the business. In the nonprofit sector, that's the philanthropist, longer term. In the for-profit world, we ultimately go to an IPO where we're gonna go out to the stock market and sell stock. We don't have that capital market in the nonprofit sector, but long-term investors do provide a fair amount of capital for building buildings and helping us grow the business. So in the work that you do, and in the work that is being done through UCF's Strengthening Communities program, mm -hmm. you're trying to get nonprofits to think in terms of finding investors and philanthropists. Absolutely, and you start that process with engagement. I don't know if Marianne mentioned that the Center for Public and Nonprofit Management has a stimulus grant in which kids actually are paired with nonprofits to go out and provide direct services. That's engagement. All activity of investors starts with engagement. And so if we're not training people to engage in solving problems, they never get to the point where they want to invest money to do it. You don't suddenly wake up and say, you know, I have enough wealth, I think I'll start giving money. That engagement is critical. Our role, UCF's role, is to build the capacity of the nonprofit sector. We do it through investment, they do it through hands-on education and application of those skills. At the end of the day, when you can build capacity and make it sustainable, in the for-profit business, we call that profitable. You're sustainable if you're profitable. Well, in the nonprofit sector, you're sustainable if you're profitable, except that's when the money goes back into the business. It doesn't go to shareholders or equity holders around the table. Is there a segment in the nonprofit world that we could identify as being most important? Um, the segment that feeds the hungry or the segment that provides health care? Is, is there a most important that, that's a tough question. I think from people's hearts around the outside, every donor, every philanthropist, every investor has something that they think is most important, and that's what makes the sector work. If I were to tell you, for instance, that social services, feeding people, is more important than the arts community, at the top of your head, you'd go, that makes perfect sense. But in the much longer range, quality of life side of this community, with art, without arts and culture, without human services, without the educational component, we'd never be able to help people move to the next level and build the economy. And so if you think that this is a market-driven process where investors who care what they care about make the investments, that's the market at work. That's the fair market at work, making certain that there's always capital to do the things we need, but never enough capital to do it all. All right, well, thank you very much for joining me today. I've been talking with Mark Brewer, President and CEO of the Community Foundation of Central Florida. And that's gonna do it for now. I'm Alicia Callanan Mandigo. Thanks for watching Public Affairs Today. This program was made possible by a grant from the UCF College of Health and Public Affairs, which promotes excellence in undergraduate and graduate education, research, and community service in health-related professions and public affairs.